back on the stone. So. All the way up from Fayetteville, all of us. Not I guess you came from right over there, didn't you? The village. <laughs> Wait, you came from a whole 30 seconds away. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Look at the size of that. Is that full? I don't know. It's a little bit better. Oh, so <laughs> that was a burling game. Yeah, that's trick. Got it. Yeah. It ended up on our way to the street. Really? Yeah. Oh, You're just following burling game's foot, footsteps left and right, aren't you? Coffee oh, cup, yeah. going to radius. I remember. I remember. I think the That's true. And he's not married. Man. You got a, is he got a lady friend at least? Yeah, he's a Who? Britness? We're playing Britta. Britta? Britta, like Britta. Brit, Britta? She says like Britta. Not Britta. Britta. Is Britta from America? Yes. Did he meet her at Radius? She's a Radius girl? They're getting engaged. Yeah, they're getting engaged. They, they got engaged? Yeah, we They all have their engaged. Uh, not engaged. So, I'm trying to think about Joe Burlingame being being married. Wait, he's engaged? No, apparently not. No, I don't think any of them are. They always have like plans to get married. Wait, Kuklinski's got a girl too? They, they all do. The, they all have Kuklinski's going to be the weddings. first one to get married. They all met him at Radius. Yeah. So they went down there looking, is what they did. Oh, yeah. They went down there like, man, I got, I got one year. I got a five minute wife, I got a barrier, and I got to get out of here. Who's Abby dating? Is that a guy down there? He came to fellowship. Brenda came to fellowship too. Britta. Because it's Abby's roommate. Oh. oh, how many people are at Radius? The likelihood of hooking up in the old sense of the world word is high. There more girls. About ten minutes ago. I went into Starbucks at six oh one. They were just open. Got this one right here. We have my quiet time at that Starbucks most days of the week. So we would drive up here all the time. That one right there. But not anymore. Now we never come up here. I might go to Bend the other day. Just to say, I've never seen that campus still. I just drive up there. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so far. It's true. So far. Has the traffic got any better? There's less people. That's good. Good. Yeah, get him out of here. It's freeloaders trying to come in and take our parking spots. <laughs> You know, I know that the 15 minutes, I never I get there before anybody gets there. So the 15 has helped. Right. 845 is early. Yeah, I get there at 8.15. I'm surprised they didn't move the, the second service back to 1045. Wait, they changed. Honestly, I think, I think Mark was saying they were kind of hoping 845 to push some people to the... Oh, the 9 was the overflow one? Really, Fable's the other way around. We have more at 10.30 than 9. Why, why, are people, why would there be more? At, I guess we have more college students. And if you have a lot of families with the young kids, they just want to get it over with. So. Oh, that's true. Yeah, there was the 8 up here. 8, 9, 30, 11. Yeah. Well, actually, probably, we never had. Yeah. Well, I think the nine is packed, too. Well, at Rogers, all the, 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 the games don't people that went to the eight. Yeah. Probably just go to the nine now. I bet they're glad to get rid of that eight as well, the staff. Um, because my assumption is that Laura Joachim is on this 
She's, she's tuned in. I'm on. Text me. Laura Joachim, text me. If you're watching, I guarantee you she's watching. Maybe she's not up right now. It's supposed to start right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's see if she texts me. So it's, it's supposedly on. Yeah. Might have been I have no idea. Distract already with the music. Yeah, you're right. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy. All right. Well, I'm not going to wait on Laura, but I'm, gonna, I'm expecting a text from her any moment. Um, all right, here's what we got today. Um, I don't like any of the way this room is set up for four people. We should be sitting in a coffee shop. Way more fun. But we'll make do. Um, Cody, pray for us then, in light of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, dear Father God, thank you for the opportunity that we have um, to meet and just discuss um, your word um, and just um, uh, ecclesiology and um, how that all plays out, God. Uh, may you just be glorified through these conversations. And as we come to learn more about you, um, for your name and your fame, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, that made me nervous. We're talking about end times today, right? Yeah. All right, good, good. Well, the class is ecclesial. Okay, that got me nervous. Like, I'm in the wrong class. Um, yeah. So, okay, yeah. Oh, it, we're talking end times. Yeah, end times today. I was like, okay, I better be the right thing here. Um, okay, so uh, open up, if you wouldn't mind, the Our Faith Notes. Oh, my gosh! Oh my she wasn't in the flesh. In the flesh. Yeah. I literally was just saying, I bet Laura's tuned in, so I'm te text me when you get this. Text me on the phone. Sorry. Here she is. Um, so open up the Our Faith um, uh, thing I sent you. Here's why I like, I actually really like the Our Faith class structure. Um, you know which uh, lesson was eight. Eight, yeah, session eight, page 79 for you since you have the full book. Um, what I like about our faith is it's just enough, like there's just enough like skeletal structure to build something with, but it's not so cumbersome and overwhelming that just to get through the material kind of is a slog. So with that in mind, um, it leaves a lot of room for discussion. And so I hope it posted accurately. I downloaded it yesterday as a PDF and put it on there. Okay. Um, so what, what we're going to do is, uh, we're, today we're talking about end times. So the last days, eschatology as it's often called. And eschaton just means, eschatos means last or end or final. And then ology, study of. So study of the final things, study of the final days. And today we get to come full circle. You, I am assuming, had conversations with Roland about the continuity, discontinuity between Israel and the church or oftentimes reframed as the debate between dispensationalists and reformed people. And one, two, three of you I've had personal conversations with this conversation <laughs> recently. Um, and so today we get to bring that conversation home full circle uh, a little bit because your view, the, the glasses that you put on in that discussion will largely inform somewhat how you even approach some of these conversations. Here's the thing though. Um, we, so the three of us, are in a different class right now. That's a, we'll loosely call it a class. It's a, it's a, it's a barely guided tour through some things where we're looking at New Testament general epistles. So that would be not Paul. And we concluded with Revelation a month ago. And now we're in this class, which is a class on the theology of eschatology. That's going to be a little bit different. But my hope would be that we barely have to look at Revelation today. Um, that's my hope. But I'm sure we will. So I'm sure we'll end up talking about it. Um, but let's build to there, shall we? Let's get a big picture of uh, how did Jews understand the eschaton? What does the New Testament do with that? And uh, to do that, let's take a look. So um, let me just first ask this question. When I, when I say end times, what words come to your mind as far as your emotions? Pretty standoffish. Okay. Because it's weird? Uh, or because Christians fight about it? Fight about it. So you want to stay away from it because this has been a topic of major debate or uh, battles. And so it's like, I just don't even want to wade into that. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. So, sometimes you like to wade into that, though. You like to get right <laughs> in the middle of it, I know. Yeah. Um, what other emotion words? We said end times, revelation, afterlife, horror. horror. I got horror film. 
Yeah, it is kind of weird, like a, like a weird horror movie. Um, confusion. Lots of confusion. So it's just like I don't want to go in there because it's like a it's like a room. It's a maze on the other side of that room. Um, okay, what else? Interesting or anticipation. A positive emotion word. Yeah, I'm hey. excited about a lot of things. Okay, excitement. I have, I have a lot of friends who like feel like they have a lot of trauma around some of the movies they watched growing up or books they left read. behind one and two and um, there's a movie apparently involves a guillotine um, about end times involves a, uh, what? a guillotine night. it's a four part kind of like a left behind series mm -hmm. but what's it called thief in the night but that's like the first one I don't please know. tell is it made by Christians oh yeah oh I'm gonna well, watch it and oh, no. my friend who grew up at a like conservative <laughs> private school uh, Christian school, so they watched it religiously every year. Wow! And she loves the Lord. She's like, I can't read Revelation anymore. And oh, she's, yes. she's going to get the reading Revelation responsibly, but she's really interested in some of the things that I've read. Cool. She's like terrified of. It might tamp things down for her a little bit. Yeah, just give a, a responsible <laughs> reading to it. What a what a. I would say provocative title to that book. Also, a little bit. That's kind of a that's kind of a jerk move to name your book "Reading Revelation Responsibly." Yeah. Like that's kind of a jerk move. Um, okay, so confusion, some excitement. Uh, I'm hearing things like standoffish. Um, what was your word? Horror. Oh, horror. <laughs> that's a nice little <laughs> light word. I don't even know how to classify that one. Um, okay, so I think that I think that's a good frame for us of. I think most of us, when we think about end times, most Christians I talk to have, have one of one or two extremes. On the one extreme, they go, nobody knows. You know, I've heard I've heard people say, uh, how do they say it? Um, they it's something like it's not it's not all mill or pre mill or post mill. How do, what's the what's the what's the second half of this little saying? They say it doesn't matter because Christ's coming back. How do they how do they summarize that? I've heard it. You've heard this, right? I can't remember how they summarize it. I've always found that to be like, it's basically, it doesn't matter. So don't worry about it because when Jesus comes back, we'll look back and go, oh, it was all great. Who cares? Um, which y'all are in a theology class. So we want to be better than that. You're also going to have to define largely if you end up in missions or church planting. What are you going to do as you come to some of these passages? The other extreme I see is a hardcore obsession with end times by Christians. Um, this should not go on the record of this camera, but I'm hoping it's not recording for the next uh, 10 seconds. What I like to do with those Christian movies is you get some friends together, you get a beverage of choice, and you partake in them as a comedy. And they're really pretty great. Like the, the Left Behind movies are a great watch if in the right setting. Uh, we watch them with the McCarthys, yeah. So me, we, we, us and the McCarthys would watch bad movies together. It's one of our things that we did when they were still here before they abandoned me to Tokyo. Um, and the quote mission field, um, and so they uh, we would watch bad movies together, and uh, that's one of them that we watch. It's really good. Uh, so let's get our arms around it, then, shall we? Genesis one. Um, we've seen the big idea, and I've drawn this so many times in your presence. I'm, ha I'm, I'm tempted to make you come up here and even draw it, um, but but bear with me here, Cody. Uh, the rest of you might not even seen it before. Um, what's the big story? Like, what is the story that the, that the Bible is trying to tell? And from the beginning, what I like about how Roland did this is he summarized big ideas for you. Those big ideas which you're going to probably take and put in your, some of that you're going to weave together for your doctrinal statement or whatever you have to make for this class. Don't you have to make something like that? Yeah, so you, you need to have one page or something how you're going to do this. Um, from the very beginning, we see the idea in mind that God wants to rule through humans. Okay, that's the goal of this whole thing. God wants humans to be his co-regents with him, bringing his goodness to bear. And the, the way that I draw this frequently, and y'all need to come up with the way you're going to draw this uh, in your life, is look something like this. God invites humans, there's trees, into, that's really bad, trees, into sacred space up on a mountain. And there in that sacred space, this person needs some arms, um, there in that sacred space, he comes to dwell with them that they might experience his blessing. And then the mandate is to take that blessing out in the rest of the world. Like that's the idea. That's what Christianity is really all about. Um, that's what Judaism is all about. This is the big idea that the Bible is driving is God is locked into this plan to co-rule through humans. 
it's pretty cool. Um, I was in an evangelism class that you were in mm-hmm. yesterday, whatever it was, Sunday morning. And I think that's a compelling story. Um, I think it's compelling to people in our culture. I also think it tells us a lot of the questions our culture is asking, like why does somebody deserve to be respected? Why do their lives matter? Kinds of questions that people ask in our culture. Well, because they're made in God's image. Um, and they have a really high calling to take God's blessing into the earth. Roland summarizes that as God's original purpose and design for mankind was to live a blessed physical and spiritual life on earth. And I might add to that and take that blessing out to the rest of the world. It comes with a, with a mandate. Um, it's not just that we would experience that, but in everything that we do, like, uh, your job today, how you work the ground today, whatever that looks like in your form, your your hobby today, you're just worshiping as you go about seeing the terribly nasty rainy day that we have today. It's colder than I thought, so I had to put a sweater on this morning. All of that is ultimately part of what we were designed and called to be. And when we bring God's goodness into the world, God's justice in the world, that's tapping into what we were meant to be. It's really cool. Um, and so I like that. It's a great story. And the, the problem that we see in the scripture is, and here's how I like to draw this, um, pink is too happy to do what I want to do. Let's use, is this, this is, that one's good. Let's use, let's use this dark purple. Okay, dark purple is going to be, Genesis 3, the flood or the infection of sin comes and ravages what God has made. And as a result, the the very purpose we were created for, now we bring a curse out into the rest of the world. We are banished from the garden, and now everywhere we go, instead of blessing, we're bringing this nasty purple thing, whatever we're going to call this. We call it sin, uh, call it injustice, call it pain, call it brokenness, call it division. Whatever you want to call this, go just read Genesis 3 to 11, and you see it. Um, It culminates in humans... Uh, building a tower to their glory, okay? You're going to have to get good at summarizing the big story of the Bible quickly um, in y'all's field and in y'all's fields. Uh, summarizing the Bible quickly. How can we do that story? If you end up doing DMM or something like that, you're going to be doing this. But how would you, how would we articulate this, especially with illiterate potentially culture uh, where we wrote on a Bible? Anyway, um, this is my way. I don't know if it's successful or not, but this is how I like to do it. Uh, then the story of the Bible becomes this. Because we're now bringing the purple nasty thing out into the rest of the world, um, what's God going to do? Does he just say, to hell with you? I'm done. Like, really? Y'all made it three pages? Instead, he brings humans back in. Let's use, let's use orange for this crew. He brings a family in, the family of Abraham, and says, through you guys, we're going to get back on track this plan to bless the world. We see it right there in Genesis chapter 12. Yahweh, the covenant creator God, said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation. Y'all know this passage because you've had to memorize it, I'm sure. You've used it a bunch of your classes. Notice the repetition of blessing. Highlight it, underline it, whatever you got there. I will bless you. Make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And those who ever curse you, I will curse all peoples. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Um, we're doing, y'all are hopefully going into the nation's because that's what God's always been about. Like that's that's the story of the Bible, not some random tack on that we get in, in the New Testament or something. That's what God's who God is. Um, he wants to bless all the nations. He wanted to do it at the beginning. He the, the plan gets ruined by us, and He's bringing it back on track. Um, so when we read the Old Testament, this is the story that's supposed to be in play. However, you've read the Old Testament before, right? Yes. And we see, how does Israel fare? Not great. With the purple thing? Pretty bad, right? And now, instead of bringing blessing, Israel is bringing curse into the land. They fall victim to the very same power and uh, injustice. They create kings just like that. They, they do all the same things the nations do. They, get, they fall victim to the very same problem. And what we're going to see, now we're venturing away from our drawing here, is because of their, this infection of sin and their their failure to do what they were asked to do, God sends them out into exile. And this is, the, this is where your entire Old Testament gets formed. You've know, done panorama, you've done big picture classes. Uh, you've got a people who find themselves, we're going to do a little map here. Here's Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, there's Jerusalem. Over here is the Tigris, Euphrates, and they've gone this way. They find themselves over here. And by the way, they also went here and here. We act, 
when you do like Israel history, there's a lot going on down here in Alexandria. It's important to just know. Uh, this is where uh, like Apollos comes from down here. So sometimes we neglect that Africa had a huge part of Christianity. We almost think it was here, and then it went up here, to where the white people are. And that was oh, way down here, too, and also <coughs> over here. Anyway, um, so as they go into exile, their temple, I don't want to draw a temple. Let's just draw it this way. Their temple's foundation stones, don't mock this. I know you have a degree. Don't mock me here. Um, was destroyed. That's supposed to be a building. Here's their, here's their blocks of their temple. Here's their columns. Everything got destroyed as they get carried off into exile. And this is the plight that the most of your Old Testament was written in. Turn the page or scroll down, since most of you are using uh, a book. And as they find themselves here, uh, the PDF, as they find themselves with a broken temple, languishing in exile, the prophets begin to give them anticipation. That's the, that's the expectations. And let's look at them on page 80. Here's a, some of these expectations. We're going to come back and fill this in. Things like this. It's all broken down, and you're covered in the purple thing, but one day I will create a new heavens and a new earth. Those former things, all this brokenness, will not be remembered. They will not even come to mind. I'm going to recreate, I'm going to restore what's been busted down and broken. Um, I have thought for a long time, how, if I'm in a Muslim context, how would I tell the Old Testament story, in, especially about Israel, in any kind of way that doesn't come across as really pro-Israel, anti-Palestinian, all that stuff. And this would be one of my stabs at it, is Israel, when they weren't being a light to the nations, was actually failing at what they were meant to do. So when Israel enslaves the nations and uh, oppresses the nations, that's actually them missing their calling. So when God wants to recreate Israel, what he's doing is he's not recreating a nation state to then oppress. He's trying to recreate the thing that blesses. We have to massage that out. That'd probably be very difficult um, in any of that context, I would, I would guess. Um, here's one of those expectations. Here's another one. Daniel 2. We're not going to go all the way to Daniel 2 and 7 because we just did that with you guys. Um, Daniel 2 and 7, they paint a picture in fast, fast summary of four earthly kingdoms. Kingdom 1, 2, 3, 4. We're going to find out this one's Babylon. The ones who take them into exile. This one will be Persia. This one will be the Greek Empire. And the fourth one has a question mark. What is the fourth one? Um, we're going to come back to this. Because diff different Jews interpret this fourth one in different ways. Depends on which Jew you ask. If you ask a Jew in 167 BC, they think this is what's called the Seleucid Kingdom. One of the four that got ripped up when Greece fell apart. And this will be who they think it is. Yes, Jesus, he comes along, and I'm pretty sure Jesus has in mind, this probably is the Roman Empire. Um, but either way, there's a fifth one. This is the one that we're going to highlight here, and this would be the heavenly kingdom, God's kingdom. And in Daniel 2 and 7, it's the same picture. You're going to get four kingdoms, although the fourth has some question marks, and it's going to be followed by the heavenly kingdom. Okay, here's the culmination of that in Daniel chapter two. You see it right here. And I'll come. Was that a question? Mm -hmm. I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, in the time of those kings, whatever this fourth one is, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush those kingdoms and bring them to end, but it will endure forever. Uh, look at Roland's note. All human governments will fail. <laughs> Um, and God will rule the earth forever. I think that's true, um, including this government that we are a part of now, so we shouldn't put our hope in it. But on top of that, let's get a little more near to what their expectations are. They find themselves, the Jews have found themselves under these, um, these empires. So for them, this is not some distant future reality. They are looking for this expectation. We need the kingdom of God to come. Where's the heavenly kingdom? And uh, depending on how you articulate number four, either way, they're all expecting it. Um, if you're in 167, they think what the Maccabean revolt is doing is setting this up. If you're at Jesus's day, what he's going to say is, yeah, they weren't any better. They got overwhelmed by the purple thing. Jesus comes along and goes, no, that was almost like a taste of it. In fact, we're going to do so. We need to see another restoration of God's kingdom. And if you 
put on certain glasses, you're going to say even Jesus was not establishing a kingdom would be in the future. Some kind of future kingdom. We'll come back to that, I know, in a minute. Cody, what was your question? Um, so it, it does seem like there's four, but could some people maybe interpret it as five with separating out iron and then iron and clay? With Because with, like, I was looking at it in, in like verse 41. It says, and as you saw the feet and the toes, part of the, partly of parse clay and partly of iron, shall be a divided kingdom, uh, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it. So it was like, the division of Rome? Yes, yeah, that's, that's how some see it, yeah. Some see the fourth kingdom as many stages. Mm -hmm. There's a unified stage and a divided stage, and there's eight, there's this, there's this time when these seven kings rise up as a different stage, and one of them will subdue three or ten kings, one subdues three, and seven follow him, and then he has the utter's great boasts. Some see a lot of chronology um, in that fourth mm -hmm. piece of the statue or the fourth mm -hmm. beast. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, yeah, it depends how you look at it. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. We're talking about a kingdom, some yeah. kind of an empire. Mm -hmm. um, you got to decide how much chronology you're going to put into that. Uh, and it's un we're unclear what to do with it. Especially since, I mean, in a sense, it's, I, I need to go back and reread Daniel 2 and 7, but like, it sounds like there's five divisions of the statue being like the iron mixed with clay being the fifth one. Yeah, that's, that's what I was... Mm -hmm. Does it describe it that way? Because I mean, there's yeah. definitely four beasts, and that's a lot easier to... Four beasts. Either we might say that the Daniel 7 may clarify okay. Daniel 2 in that sense. Yeah. Now, the difficulty with the fourth beast is that three of them are given an animal that they're compared to. The a, uh, a, like a lion, it. a bear, and a leopard. The fourth yeah. one, it just says it's different. Yeah. Uh, which... Might even be intentional of yeah. the on the author's part that this fourth beast can sort of flex. Yeah. yeah. Um, when we get to Jesus, I think Jesus at Olivet is labeling this fourth beast as the eagle of Rome. Yeah. Um, I think he's he's narrowing it, narrowing it down for us. But I don't think though he's erasing that it could have also been these this Seleucid Empire from 167. It's almost like there was a category that can kind of move and shape for him. Um, Were the Seleucids of Rome? Power? Yeah, so when, so when, uh, let me draw, let me get all the way over here then. Here's, this is Turkey, and this becomes Greece, down here, and here's the Rome. Uh, the Seleucids, here's Antioch, this is where the church actually came, comes out of. This becomes a major capital when Alexander the Great, who dies way over here, when he, he goes all the way to freaking India. That's crazy. He conquers everything. He made himself Caesar. Conquers everything. When he dies in Susa or gets assassinated, they basically went like this. Split, split, split. So you have kingdom one, two, three, and four. This one down here was in Alexandria, and it's called the Ptolemaic dynasty. This one's here called the Seleucids. And it's basically the names of the people that Ptolemy. Yeah. Um, this becomes their succession of kings, these two are always fighting. And who's in the middle of them? This becomes the context largely for Daniel, especially Daniel 8 to 12. So this thing about the goat, God, what's that? This thing about the goat fighting and then all these different, what they're talking about are these battles. The kings of the north will rise up with the kings of the south. It's historical battles going on between these two. And all of this is taking, uh, Alexander dies in 332 or 330 and the Maccabean revolt is in 167 so these years this is battle back and forth many scholars think Daniel is actually written more here because the, the, the history is so accurate or we believe in supernatural prophecy because um, Daniel lived back in the 500s um, I don't really care I could go either way on that I, it doesn't bother me if Daniel's written here uh, and they're using Daniel as a name to tell a story through, but I'm supposed to... Esther, same same thing with Esther. Mm -hmm. um, so, y'all y'all tracking with me? You you have a face of, what? What is this? Okay. Questions, or are you just taking it in? Which, we're talking about 167 AD, right? B, this is BC, before Jesus, yeah. So, uh, Alexander the Great, okay. he is a Greek king, and he conquers from up here all the way to India. Yeah. When he dies, this is this fourth kingdom, or this third kingdom right here. When he dies, the kingdom of Greece is split into four kingdoms. And one of these two right here fight back and forth a bunch. Some think that this fourth kingdom is not Rome, 
but this empire called the Seleucid Empire. Rome comes along from over here and takes everything. And so is the fourth kingdom Rome who took everything? Hardcore dispensationalists will see, nope, it's not Rome. This is actually going to be some future Antichrist kingdom in the future that we've not seen this, this uh, empire fully develop. And they take the chronology of some of the stuff y'all are asking as their, the, their proof of that. So maybe the Roman Empire was the torso, but then it's been divided and the, t the clay and the toes. But one day, this little horn will rise up. And it's this Antichrist figure. We're in the days of the fourth king, something like that. Does that, make, does that clarify a little bit? 3.30, and the, this is the date for the Maccabean Revolt, which is what Hanukkah is about. Um, it's a really important day for the New Testament. We just never think about it because we are we don't we don't care. Um, Follow-ups? We're trying to build an Old Testament expectation before we even look at the New Testament. This is the big failure, I think, of Christians when we talk about end times is we assume it's in a vacuum of Jesus' return only. And we need to do better than that. Uh, yes? So, um, I'm looking at it, but I can't remember where it is. So, pretty much isn't in this this uh, interpretation of the, of the dream, like, the statue is destroyed. Mm -hmm. So, if the idea is, you know, the room is up, would the statue be destroyed through Jesus' death and resurrection, or is the statue destroyed in the second coming? So, that will depend on the glass you put on. Okay. So... We're going to look at. We're going to go to New Testament in a minute, mm -hmm. and the big, the big question we're going to ask. I'm going to ask you. And you got to wrestle with it. Is okay if these are our Jewish expectations. Jesus is not severing from that story. Mm -hmm. He's a part of that story. He in fact says, "I'm coming to fulfill, culminate, climax, whatever word you want to put in there." You then got to ask the question: How did he fulfill that in his first coming? And if he if you say he didn't fulfill that, then you're going to put it all in the second coming. By necessity. That's how the theology works itself out. Um, so we'll come back to this question for you, Cody. Um, and I'm sure we'll get a coffee afterwards at some point and talk about it. Um, <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Let's look at Daniel 12. Um, we're just building ideas here, okay? We're building categories. Then we'll, we'll put them all together for some of you that want more systemized. We're in a systematics class, not a Bible class. I have to recognize that. So um, we're trying to put things, we're trying to bring systematics to this. Um, it's not my favorite way to do it. Uh, Daniel 12. I actually really love this book. I like the way that Roland did this book. Daniel 12. And I keep, I want to make sure he gets, this is Roland's. He did a good job on this one. Um, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. This is about the only note in the Old Testament. And even it's, a, it's not necessarily cryptic, but it's kind of sits, it's sitting in this context. Um, he says, some to life, put a little underline there or circle it or whatever, highlight some to everlasting life others to shame and everlasting contempt. Here's the big idea. All of the dead will be resurrected, but with different destinies. I got a text from a college student two days ago. I'm reading through uh, Psalms, I think she was reading. She said, what was David's view of the afterlife? And my response was, it's complicated. <laughs> um, and then I had a voice memo her uh, a little bit because it was too much to text. And what I was trying to, I had to help her understand that for a Jewish person, let's, let's, let's draw this out. Let's put ourselves in, where's my thing here? This, this is the worst. You can't, you can't, it's just so big. Like, it's hard to, it's hard to work with. Um, do I like, is purple working for me? Let's see, what, let's see what blue does. What is that? Um, oh, I like blue. So, here I am. I'm an Old Testament believer, and I'm happy, and I'm living my life. What they think is down here is Sheol. This is the place where the dead people go because we put them down there when we bury them. They go down into the ground. And if I'm to die, now I'm not happy. Um, there is debate even as to what they think is the what we call the soul or the spiritual thing, the immaterial. There are many Jews who think, this, 
the immaterial is really just my being. There is no separation from my material and my immaterial. So when I die, that's it. There's no, I'm not, I don't go be with God. I, I, I'm dead. All Jews are assuming that the dead, should, I, I'm use, not these exclusive categories. Almost all Jews think that when a person dies, they go to this place of the dead, good or bad, righteous or unrighteous. So that's why when you read the Psalm, this was her question. She's like, why is David saying things like, don't abandon my soul to Sheol. Don't let me go down there, blah, 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 blah. And you see this a lot in the Psalms. Well, that's because the Jews don't have a fully formed idea of what it looks like to be with God when you die or to have resurrection, experience that future hope. And so there is some uncertainty at a Jewish funeral before the time of Jesus. Uh, they, they're not looking around going, but we know that in Christ, they're going to be raised, blah, 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 blah. Now, here's the part that I told this girl. Um, they definitely don't have a view of, um, well, our soul goes and floats up in a golden city somewhere, and we get to be with Jesus forever up there, and that's really cool. Of course, they wouldn't have Jesus as part of it at all. Um, we get to be with Yahweh up there forever, way up there in the sky. Um, by the way, the New Testament doesn't really say that either. This girl, I, didn't, I was trying to help her help her see the the Old and New Testaments are largely concerned with my bodily resurrection. This is we're talking a little bit about personal end times, personal eschatology. The Jewish understanding is I'm dead. I'm in the place of the dead, and it's notes like Daniel 12, but only a couple like this that give me the idea that if you're righteous, that's what the shining is supposed to represent. That one day there's a day coming when you will shine like the stars. Daniel 12, see it? And I'm gonna put a big dot, dot, dot there. I'm dead. Some Jews think maybe one day I will shine like the stars. We're gonna see this group will later be represented by the Pharisees. They hold to a future bodily resurrection. We, you're gonna see in the New Testament, the Sadducees think it's over. And this is probably the dominant position, even. Um, the crew that lives out in Qumran, that writes the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they think shine. Okay, this is your this is your it's a massive debate. It's so massive that when Jesus is in Passion Week at Passover in the temple talking, they think we could trap him, and they bring up this question. Um, it'd be like us going, "I'll show this guy." Let's ask him, "Did God choose us?" Or do we choose God? They think they pick a theological hot button issue from their day, and they think this will trap Jesus. Um, and they love to do this, and so we have to put that in our category. Uh, last one, Joel two. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Next to day of the Lord, just write day of accountability. Um, Day, the day of the Lord is a theme in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it just means a day when God will bring accountability. Um, it can mean end times. But I think we almost, we get a, a hyper obsession with day of the Lord as it only can mean end times. It only is the case at all. Um, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said. Big idea. God will come in judgment of sin, and only those who call on the Lord will be saved. Now, I want you to put Joel 2 in the back of your mind. Right, back to it in a minute. Um, now, what is our Old Testament expectations? Here we go. Before we turn the page. O-T expectations. What are they expecting? As we turn the page of the New Testament, what is their eschatology? Because the New Testament eschatology is going to be very similar with a twist. What is their eschatology? They have some kind of an idea, we're just gonna put all these pieces together, of a recreated earth. We might say heavens and earth. A recreated heavens and earth. Not an escape from the heavens and earth, or from the earth, but a recreated heavens and earth. Number two, God's kingdom will finally be established. We're gonna see the king yeah, and that, what that means is Yahweh will be with us. He will come and visit us. Like God will be with us. When I say God's king, that means God's with us. Number three, that we're going to have resurrection. And like I said, that one was debated. And finally, let's get this, this last one in because this is really important. Blessing of all. That's the whole idea, right? 
restore what's been broken. We come back to this story. That's the bigger picture. We can get back on track. So here's their expectation. Let's, let's, let's use blue now. Their expectation is even though they have failed and languished in exile, God is going to return. And when God returns, when he establishes his kingdom, he's going to make Israel finally be who they were meant to be and take that blessing out to the world. It's what we've always been after here anyway. Same story, rinse and repeat. Tracking so far. We're trying to summarize systematically a lot of Old Testament eschatology and their expectations. Now, when we turn the page to the New Testament, here's your key question. The key question you have to ask is, how much of this does Jesus fulfill in his first coming? It's really the question. In Jesus' ministry, death and resurrection, how much of this has now been absorbed? If you say most of it, then you're going to probably tend towards what we call like the covenant or the replacement. I think that's an unfortunate name. The covenant reform side, not the dispensational side. Okay? If you say, this is the question I'm more concerned about than continuity, discontinuity. That question is a derivative question in my mind, too. There's a huge set of Old Testament expectations about what will happen in, quote, the last days. And has Jesus inaugurated the last days? Or is this a foretaste or a down payment or a little glimpse, however you want to call that? And different words would mean you're moving down this spectrum. You call it a little glimpse, you're going to be more over here. If you call it a foretaste, you're going to move this. If you call it a down payment, you say this is a partial fulfillment. This is all the language that people on this side use. Uh, how much of this is inaugurated or fulfilled in Jesus? That's really the question that you have to wrestle with. Questions for a move to the New Testament. I think I don't know that they're not formulated yet. Yeah, so let's, let's put brass tacks on it. We got a heavenly kingdom following whatever we do with this one. Let's, let's, let's say it's Rome, okay? Um, we have a heavenly kingdom that's going to follow a worldly kingdom and it's going to be established and will endure forever. It's one of our main expectations over here. Has Jesus done that? That's really the question. Um, I don't care about pre-mill, post-mill, all of it. I don't, that's not my question. Has Jesus done that when he walks around saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand? That's the question. What do you do with that language? We tend to get past that language. We, mix, we don't know what to do with it. Is this the kingdom? Is it not the kingdom? That's really their question, though. Um, is Jesus doing that now? Yes. So this is like a critique leaning on the side of like, well, we can't really know. We, we know. we don't know. We shouldn't look at Revelation. We shouldn't say it. Uh, not a critique, more, more like an agreement with that side. So would you say that in the Old Testament, it was pretty clear in the way in which these things would be fulfilled for the Jews you know, going into it? Clear? No. Because Jews debated like crazy. Yes. And, and, we, and we debate you we know, what right. the second coming will look like. And so the question I have is, so we, we have this idea of, the Jews have this idea, okay, there will be a king that comes and establishes his reign and defeats Rome and brings us freedom and justice in the way it was, well, actually, you know, Jesus came to defeat sin and death. In, in the way that we look, so now with this second coming, are, are we almost going to, do we have the ability to fall into that same, we have this really, we have this great understanding of how, this is going to go, but actually we're, we're maybe missing the bigger picture. Uh, I think that that is a, that depends on how you land. If you landed and said, I think that Jesus has inaugurated his kingdom in a significant way, then you're probably going to look at people that are hyper obsessed with the end times and go, I think I might be missing the big picture here. Mm. Depends on how you answer it. If you said, no, this is just a partial we get a taste of this, but the kingdom hasn't been established yet. Then you're going to go, no, we really need to study this and, and mm -hmm. think towards that future kingdom. So okay. I wouldn't want to say, of course, because it depends on how you land. Um, mm -hmm. it, you might think those people are being silly, or you might think, man, it's a really important topic to study and, mm -hmm. and, and brush up on. We haven't even touched Revelation yet. Um, other thoughts? So Questions? Yes, ma'am. The Daniel 12 one, talking about shine light and brightness. That really is the only 
one in the Old Testament that mentions that humans might resurrect? It's very, very, it's very unclear. It's the most clear, we might say. That's why it's in this book. Um, there's ideas in the Psalms or the ideas in the prophets of the new recreation, uh, God restoring what's been broken. And there's some that think in that he's, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to participate in that. Um, so if you are, if you were at a funeral of anybody in this Jewish period, they don't think it's, some, some of them do think it's bleak and hopeless. They think it's over. That's it. That's it. There are some Jews that have held to that persuasion. There are other Jews that said, no, no, no. In the last days, when God finally puts things to right, when we experience our kingdom again, it's going to be a, a day when he's going to bring resurrection and we'll walk in that. Um, that sounds very New Testament-y, right? Yeah. Jesus actually will come and, and land on one of these two sides of this debate. We're going to put a twist on it in a minute, though, which is nobody, I'll give you the twist now, nobody yeah. thinks that in the, how do you draw resurrection? Uh, nobody thinks that in the middle of history, there's going to be resurrection. No, that's the big, that's the Christian shocker. Jesus' empty tomb in the middle of history is un, that's, the Jews are not expecting that. It creates the question. If this has happened in 30 AD, 33 AD, which however you date it, what does that mean for these things? See, see why it's a big, even, even this one, even this one, you go, well, of course that hadn't happened yet. It's got to be future. This becomes a major event, and this is one of the, so one of the apologetics for the resurrection, okay? So, yes, women at the tomb is a good one. I use that one on the street level a lot. They would never use women as their, they're not valid witnesses. That's a great apologetic for the resurrection. The biggest apologetic for the resurrection is this. How do a group of committed, the disciples, Jesus' followers, they are committed that even if there is, if there's going to be a resurrection, which is a big if, that it's going to be at the end. How do they all of a sudden start walking around preaching that resurrection has happened and living like it to the point of martyrdom, some of them? There has to be an, there's an explanation for that somewhere. You could say they sold a body, but they've had some encounter with an empty tomb. They believe the tomb is empty. Now, but whether it really was or not, that doesn't solve that, but for, the, for your skeptical friends. But these men and women had a genuine encounter with what they think is an empty tomb. And a resurrected Jesus. You call it hallucination, you call it whatever you want to call it, a drug trip. However, they have changed, it'd be like us changing a significant piece of our theology overnight. To the point of being willing to, the, to, and then, then willing to die over it, yeah. That, that, that demands explanation. That, in fact, is the bulk of, so the, the book of record that everybody uses, whether they like him or not, is N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God, which is uh, his 950-page book on all of this. And it's fascinating, and that's his big argument. And so all, even skeptics who interact with that book and try to come, you have to explain it somehow. And I think Ryan has put a pretty compelling case to say, you, sh tell me another way this happened. So, to me, it's a good apologetic. It just takes so much explaining, that apologetic. The women's so easy. You know, women at the tomb, they were the witnesses. Nobody would have witnesses be invalid witnesses. Ah, see, they would, they would have erased that. It must be true. Much simpler than uh, walking through Jewish expectation. Um, does that make sense? The big twist will be, what do you do with this? Um, yes, Cody. This is kind of just a short follow-up to Andre's um, initial question. But they also look at uh, Ezekiel, the, you know, the dry bones, you know, green being brought back to life like a resurrection. Would that be another? Yeah. The dry bones is clearly a vision. So the dry bones, man, is that individual souls coming back to resurrection or is that the nation of Israel being restored okay. to their place? Um, and that's, so we see this as individuals, but different. Daniel, and, and even Daniel, though, is, is very visiony. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 Daniel is hard to take as theological literal necessarily all the time. It's giving him categories that I could be literal with. So I'm not saying it's, it's figurative. But even this Daniel 12 passage is in a context about Exiled Israel coming back to life, you could you could say it's about the nation as a whole. Um, I think it's about individuals, uh, but I think it's one of our few notes that we get. Turn the page. That was a big setup. Now we got to turn the page. Do you think that the Lord 
still like has a bunch of tricks up his sleeves and he's just excited to reveal them. Like we have all of our ideas and he's like, oh, I'm gonna blow these up so much. I'm sure, <laughs> yeah, almost certainly, I'm sure that when it's all said and done, all we will look back and be like, oh. man, that was cool. I did not see that one coming. Yeah. Even Christians, I think. Um, the other big, the, uh, here's another big twist. Um, and if you, this hasn't settled with you in this ex ecclesiology class that you're in, then it should. And this is one of the reasons why I still affirm dispensationalism because of the massiveness of what this would have been like. I think this creates a new era. If this hasn't landed on you, then go take some time today and think about it. Um, here's a twist for you. God's place of residence is an individual Christian Jesus followers. Pentecost. Not a temple building. That's a major twist. And that's why Paul then appeals when he talks about your behavior, your sexuality, all that stuff. And like Corinthians, for example, he says, because you're the temple. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a major shift. We have failed to teach our people that. Um, you are where God lives. That's really, a, nobody was expecting that. Um, Jesus told him, like in, all, in the last Upper Room Discourse, he keeps telling him, I'm going to send the Spirit. He's going to be with you. How do you abide with me and know I'm with you and see the Father, all that? I'm going to send the Spirit. But they're even still, they're like, I think even in 90, when, they're right, when John's right now, he's like, this is still crazy. How could it not be a building? Um, it's always a building. That's really cool. How do you, the question for you three is going to be, how do you, I guess the question for all of us, in ministry, how do we make that come across as important to people? Uh, that's just, I found that to be difficult. The people go, yeah, whatever. I still want to go live the American life today. It, it's, it's so ethereal, it seems, or abstract. It doesn't have the stinkiness, whereas like money and stuff and sex can be like right there. Um, I don't know how to convince people. Could, could it yeah. be almost like the conviction? Like the way I've, I've tried to convey it with people the disciples, like, hey, like if you've given your life to Christ, your life is no longer your own. There's no longer you who live. Like Christ who lives through you. So like if you if you truly make that commitment, then it's not just you anymore. I wish I wish that appeal landed on favorable ears. Largely, I mean, I feel like people go, yeah, that's you know, whatever. I mean, that's yeah. not, it's more been one-on-one. -on -one right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of it's a challenge. I think that's the challenge is people don't think about temples and presence of God like they did. Mm -hmm. And then we have a nice, easy, comfortable lives. So it's easy to we just not care. Yeah. The, oh, spirit being, that's always been a thing. But they didn't recognize that. What a shock that would have been. Yeah, that's a major twist. A lot of times we don't teach. Yeah, you're right. Or people don't read the Old Testament. We don't have any explanation for it anyway. Yeah. yeah, you're right. You're totally right. Um, turn to page 82. Um, okay, now this becomes the context for the what we call the Olivet. Open your Bibles, actually. Let's go to uh, Matthew 24. I'm about to write a paper on comparing the three Olivet discourses, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's. I don't know why I'm so interested in it. Um, I think I know why. I have a reason. Um, <laughs> so they are very difficult. In our Gospels class that some of you took, I think I was in New Orleans Skyping when we did this one, and I was trying to be extremely careful. I was sitting in the foyer of that house that we were airbnb in New Orleans, um, and I was trying to be extremely careful in unpacking the Olivet Discourse. It's, a, it's thorny. Um... Let's look at it. Matthew 24. It begins actually in 23. It's a bad chapter break because the setup's in 23. Look at 23. Here's our setup. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. He's pr pronounced a series of judgments. Look at chapter 23. Whoa, 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 whoa to all of you. And then it follow, It ends with Jesus saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. This, this should sound really Old Testament prophet Style. Like this, you should read this and be like, yeah, this makes sense. This is how a Jewish prophet would speak to his people. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stones, and stones those who are sent to her. How often I've wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. So that's a big underline. You just don't want it. Um, look, your temple is going to be left to you desolate. And you won't see me again until you quote Psalm 118 about me. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> and they start walking down to the temple and uh, walking away from the temple. And the disciples, I don't know, I think they don't know what else to do. I think they're kind of like when you're in a cell group, and you're like, that was kind of challenging. See any good movies lately? Because um, they go, um, 
Look at the buildings, Jesus. You talk about the temple, and like, that's a pretty cool building, though, right? Like, that's it's nice. Look how big it is, and the gold, and man, it's pretty cool what Herod's been doing around here. And he's got the, sca the scaffolding still up, by the way. The scaffolding's still going. It'll be up all of Jesus' ministry, and it will be all the way up till 66 AD, and then they destroy it in 70. Oh, so they only got four years of this thing, so being fully completed. Um, so the scaffolding's still up, and they go, man, look at this renovation. This is amazing, and look how big it is, and it was so, it's so cool. And here's a typical Jesus uh, interaction. He goes, you see all these things? I tell you, from one, not one stone will be left on top of another until it's all torn down. Which is just very Jesus way to handle that. Because uh, frequently Jesus will shock them. Um, so I, I get why they're confused a lot. And I'd be like, uh, what are you talking about? And they, they keep walking, apparently, because now they're on the Mount of Olives. And they came to him privately. And of course they would ask the question. Um... Can you go ahead and tell us when this is going to happen? <laughs> What's what do you mean? Because the temple being destroyed is the great sign of judgment. This is the, what do you what do you mean, Jesus? Now bear in mind, just a few days earlier, he overturned the tables in the temple. They should be expecting this kind of language from him, but they can't get their mind around it. And they ask him two questions, maybe three questions actually. Is it two or three? You get to decide. The first one is this: um, When's this going to happen? Now, hopefully, I'm not around. It's probably the subtext of that. I hope that I'm not around for that. That sounds bad. Uh, when will this happen? Second question is, what will be the sign of your coming? Okay, you said it's going to happen then, and what about the end of the age, the last days? Um, the second, it's either two questions or three. So the second question may be a compound question. It depends how you want to do that. And I don't, do y'all have commas before the first one, but not the second and thirds? NIV makes it two questions. What verse? Uh, verse three. three. Yes, just just two questions. Yeah, the way they do the commas, even they're they're wading into that inter that debate. Um, and here's Jesus' answer. It's printed in your book for you as well. He basically says you're going to see war and rumor of war and nation against nation. And by the way, all of that. Oh, I erased my map. All of that's been going on. Like that, he says. Y'all know how this. Y'all know how things are. It's constant famine, constant battles, constant war. Just know that that is regular part of our world under the power of the purple thing. That's what it looks like. Then he says, then key interpretive questions with the Olivet Discourse is, what do we do with the thens? It's just this then. It's a good translation of it. What do we do with the thens? Because there's going to be there's going to be several of them in our passage. Some thens. Um, so like you see one of them in verse nine. You see another one down in verse 30, and these become the big question. Driving this is, are the, what, what's the chronology of this? Here's what Roland has printed for you in the book, and you can look it on your page, verse 9. Then, so you're going to see the regular run-of-the-mill stuff, and it's going to get really, really bad. Things are going to get really bad. Um, so expect things to get worse. There's, they're going to hate you. Um, but just stand firm to the end. The one who stands for the end, they'll be rescued from this. And the gospel, by the way, the kingdom's going to go out into all the nations during this. And then the end will come. Um, Roland has called this persecution, disappointment, defeat will go on with great advances of the gospel until Jesus returns, but the gospel will go out to all nations. If you take the then, so follow me here. If you say, okay, verses four to eight are regular part, but the then is transitioned to something different, a tribulation period of sorts or some kind of bad, extra bad period on earth that we haven't experienced yet. Which, by the way, a lot of these uh, more hardcore dispensationalists take that then that way. Then what you're going to say is everything from nine and following is a future tribulation period. That includes the gospel of the kingdom going out. So one of the knocks on DTS has been their missions understanding. And I, don't think, I think it's a bad knock. I think they actually do a really good job talking about this. But... It has been preached even at fellowship that the gospel of the kingdom going out is only during the tribulation. At least that promise. Now, we still could take the gospel to all nations because of Matthew 28. But they would say, there's been some at fellowship that even that would say, nine and everything that follows after that then is a future, a future tribulation period. You're going to have to wrestle with it. Okay? You see what you have to wrestle with? So the, the sticker, every tribe, tongue, and nation, or bust, Matthew 24, 14, 
for them would say, no, nope, only put that sticker on whenever the tribulation begins. Then you put the sticker on, on your computer, on your car. Um, if you say, no, 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 the then is just, uh, we might say it's subsequent to or part of this initial part of how things just are bad in the world. And you're going to go, no, no, that's part of the now experience. You could say the then, okay? You could say the then is not um, a future tribulation, but after a different event, namely Rome destroying the temple in 70 AD. Remember, they're talking about the temple being destroyed after all. You're going to see war and remember of war, but then it's going to get really bad. Jerusalem's going to get destroyed. you got to orient yourself to something here. Your options are more of just an ongoing experience, the temple being destroyed, or the future, um, a future tribulation period. Yes? Um, so in this section, if you, the future tribulation, let's say it's that, um, he's still talking to Jews. This isn't Christians. This is just like, Jews will be hated by all nations uh, for my name's sake, um, which is... Is, can you, is, is that Jews or is that Christians they talk about there? So he's talking to his disciples, but it's being written by Matthew probably around 60s or early 70s. So there's the perspective of the original saying of it from Jesus. Then there's a perspective of why the authors included this and included these kinds of details about it. And those are, I, I know that sometimes when I answer it that way, that seems like it's a cop out, but this the authors are all meaning something by why and what they include. And so does Matthew want to re include this story to get his readers to see this as those who were Jesus followers mm -hmm. in 70 AD or 68 or whatever it may be? Yeah. Or is he quoting verbatim Jesus at that time and he's talking largely to his disciples, but it will mm -hmm. also mean those who will come and follow Jesus later. Yeah. Why has Matthew included this is the question. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, if it's just... I don't know. I'm getting caught up, like, whether it's just talking to the Jews. Because it's like, for my name's sake, I'm like, the Jews aren't hated for Jesus, but hated because Jews. I'm just looking in the greater span of, like, right now. Right. The, the answer then would be, he's talking to his followers. followers. Um, yeah, the people that will claim his name. And they're going to be starting largely from Jews, yeah, Jewish that, people. Uh, time, yeah. if, you, if you view this more as something that is not a future, still future event, but something that happened around 70 AD, wouldn't the Jews fall into that category of mm -hmm. the ones who had begun to fall on Jesus and were not necessarily even called Christians? Yeah, the, 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 the way, people. yeah. And in fact, a lot of the ones who were hating the Christians were the other Jews. Mm -hmm. Was this written, um, what audience was Matthew written to? Matthew seems to be written largely with a Jewish audience in mind based on how much Old Testament he fills. Okay. He starts with a genealogy after all. Um, and so most think that he's writing to a Jewish, think about it this way, a scattered Jewish audience struggling to follow Jesus mm -hmm. because now it's really difficult because the synagogue starting to turn on you. And if it's after the temple has been destroyed, what do we do now? Let me, let me answer that for you. Jesus fulfills or down payments you gotta put a word in there mm -hmm. let's keep going um wait so uh well i guess go for it yeah so uh this whole 14 verse uh -huh. that going to all nations on the end will come does that mean then that there's really no task to be completed there's no, now like, unfinished task that they would probably say that ta ethne in matthew 28 uh, go therefore into ta ethne, all the nations. So uh -huh. uh, probably ta panta ethne, all the nations. They would say that's our mandate. There's that's the mandate. Not, there's no end. They you. they may not put the clock on it like the Joshua Project does. Uh, they may not go because of Matthew twenty four fourteen. There is a every the gospel what the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. Yeah. Now all of the languages. I don't want to say suspect, but for for Jesus to say the whole world, does that mean every single people group and tribe, and or does he mean a, a, is it going to go across the world? Mm -hmm. the, the, and for and him, you the, have Revelation seven nine that has totally every power. tribe and tongue or nation. So that's that would be the author of Revelation coming in and going, mm -hmm. hey, let's we mean tribes and tongues and nations. We're going out to this whole thing. For them, the world largely was the Mediterranean world. Uh, they don't even know. All the Revelation doesn't even know that North America exists. Mm -hmm. So we got to put ourselves back in their shoes. Mm -hmm. It's still cool either way. Um, I have no problem with the Joshua Projects. Like, here's our list. Um, here's our people groups. I like that 
visual, and I like that mandate. Yeah. Is it? But is that correct? I think too, because Grudem talked about the second coming as in it's a thief in the night, and it can't really be a thief in the night if there's this unfinished. Right. Right. Task. Yeah. I, I think I would probably tamp all of it down and and go. The mandate is clear to go into all the nations. Um, okay, Grudem, settle down because I, how would I know when every nation is reached yeah. in a sufficient enough way? I, I don't. That doesn't bother me that much. I'm like, let's just get, let's get busy with the mandate. Um, and it's easier for me to say sitting in a cushy Rogers uh, office, you know. And so, but yeah, I, I think more Christians take the mandate more seriously. So if I had to err on the side of the bumper sticker, my college I, uh, computer had the bumper sticker on it. And I was proud to, and I, I would err on that side, mm-hmm. even though I might have to massage that a little bit. Um, technically, it has been taught at our church that the ver- that verse fourteen is only for the tribulation. Mm-hmm. I don't think probably I know you wouldn't hold to that because of our conversations, and I bet probably many of you would struggle with that. Uh, you're going to just you got to interpret it somehow. I actually, well, I'm writing the paper, so I'll let the paper. I'll write the paper well, first. With like, um, if if there is a more dispensational like reality that happens, and the tribulation is where this is finished, but I don't think that means it starts there. Yeah, it depends what you do with it then. It's all about that then. Um, and no, notice what follows, verse 15. So, so this seems to be in the context of that series of that, that then, okay, that unit. My paper is basically about the units of this. So it's going to be a real riveting read, I'm sure. Um, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that caused the death, he, he goes to Daniel, chapter 9, and he even says, Hey, go read Daniel. That's a little note there. Jesus says, let the reader understand. He means, go check out Daniel. When you see this abomination that causes desolation, then you can know it's time to run. Okay? What do we orient this to? Do we orient this to a future tribulation, the abomination of desolation? And I'm, we're, we're spending time on this because the very next note on here in your our faith book is, before the end, a figure will rise who is who oppose God and personify evil and rebellion, the Antichrist. If you look at all of this as a future where the Antichrist has been revealed, then what you're going to do is you're going to say, verse 15, talking about this abomination that causes desolation, that's from Daniel 9, and Jesus has in mind a future Antichrist figure, because that's the great tribulation. Look, you have to run, things get really bad, uh, watch out. Uh, how dreadful it will be if those days had not been cut short and nobody would survive, blah, blah, blah. You're going to go, that hasn't happened yet. That's got to be a future. See, see the logic? So then you go, okay, if that's future, it's following the then of verse 9. So everything from verse 9 all the way down to we get to the next then of verse 30 is a unit. If you do that, then you're going to say the tribulation, the Antichrist, and now that, that mission's mandate are all part of that unit of future time. I get the logic. Um, or the other category would be, does Jesus have in mind the destruction of the temple in 70 AD? You're going to see the abomination of desolation, and that's going to be Titus the general. My son is named Titus, but it's the other Titus. The good, although his personality is much more like the Roman general who killed, maimed, uh, indiscriminately. It seems to be his, more his personality. Okay. So not the, the meek church planter. <laughs> He's much more the much more the ruthless general the way he acts. Um, we didn't we didn't know that when we named him. You know, I probably would have named him something else. Uh, Maximus is more his personality. Um, but he's, he's also short. He's zero percentile, so he's not big at all. Titus means giant. <laughs> he's, Titus means giant. He's on the zero percentile. Hattie is four inches taller than him now. She towers over, but she's two years younger than him. He's the size of like a first grader, but he's in fourth grade. But he's jacked. He's got. He, I mean, he's got. A, he's got like an eight pack. Last night we were hanging out playing a video game in the room, and he has this muscle. Okay, it's like no body fats. Whatever this muscle is, he was was like popping. Uh, like not this one, not the tricep. Whatever this is, because he just he's just so small and compact that he's just he's he's ripped. Um, whatever. Uh, now we got to talk about that. So um, he probably will. Um, I, I grew in tenth grade, but I was never as, as small as him uh, in comparison. He's very very small. Uh, he didn't need that much sympathy. He needs a little sympathy, but not too much. Otherwise, he'll he'll take advantage of it. Like I said, he's Titus the general. Um, so, 
when you come to these kinds of questions, you're going to have to, I am less interested in, can I make the systematic theology work? What I'm interested in is you're going to be somewhere having to decide what you do with Matthew 24. And I'm trying to help you. It is not easy. And whether you like it or not, whether it fits our categories or not, whether I want the bumper sticker or not, you got to decide what to do with Matthew 24. Now, the reason it matters is I think Luke, we're going, we went to Matthew. I think Luke puts all of this as Rome in 70 AD. Oh, no. Because uh, Luke will finish that middle section by saying, and the city will be trampled until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. I think Luke writes after Matthew. This is Luke 21, by the way. I think he makes, I think he clarifies what might have been unclear from Matthew. Does that make sense? It's also in Mark 13. I want Luke 21, Mark 13, Matthew 24. When you read all of them, you can't read across because Mark went first, probably. So you can't go, let me, let me. Let Luke inform Mark because Mark hasn't read Luke, but Luke may clarify something that's unclear in Mark. Does it make sense? Which were, what were the Mark's words? probably first, Mark 13, then Matthew 24. Here it is in Matthew 24, 25, and it's in Luke 21. And you, you can't just cut them out and read them side by side, but then you have to. I'll let you go figure. Um, that's why I hate systematics. Because was Matthew using Mark? Probably. Did Luke use Matthew and Mark? Or did he just have Mark? I don't know. We don't know the answer to that. Um, if, Mar if Luke has Mark and Matthew, then he might make, be making explicit what was implicit in Matthew, making it clearer. Thus, seems to be saying it's Rome. That's a, that's, I, I should have said it even quieter. Um, anyway, that's what my paper will be about. It's going to be a real doozy. Some of you are like, that sounds like the worst. Like you're doing this for a hobby? This is for fun? Are you making a um, to us? I'll do what? Were you making it for available to us? I wasn't planning on it. Well, if you emailed me in about a month, I probably could. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping that you all forget. And everybody went, nobody wants to see this again. Yeah, I'm going to write on my sabbatical. I got this class I got to get done. Um, okay. Now, go ahead. I was just noticing like, the, the one in the loop. How that section of the destruction of Jerusalem? What, is that ESV? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they are interpreting it for you with that heading. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to make sense of it. Because um, I feel like in Matthew it could be like the whole world is like in that bad situation and like running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The reason it gets really complicated, let's stick with the Matthew one. That's when we started it. And let's, let's stick with the Matthew one. Uh, if the, verse 22, if those days hadn't been cut short, then uh, no one would survive. That sounds pretty, pretty rough. And in the unit, we have verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give light. The stars will... This is Joel, by the way, this is Joel 2. We read Joel 2 earlier. I said, put Joel in your mind. Remember, I said that. I said, put Joel in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to it. Joel 2. Did I not say that? Like 45 minutes ago, it was a little said a lot of things since then. I said, put Joel 2 in the back of your mind. Um, this is where your questions, this is where this all comes to, to bear. Remember in Joel 2, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give us light, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You can flip back one page even and see it. It's this one page before, Joel 2. There it is. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, because from Mount Zion and Jerusalem there will be deliverance, blah, 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 blah. Next page over in our, our faith book, we have Jesus rooting them back to Joel 2. And so you're going to have to put all those pieces together and decide is Joel 2 sun being dark and all this destruction language, is that summarized in Rome destroying the temple? you got to decide. Or is that not enough and you need some kind of a future whole earth thing? Because it's followed by the then of verse 30. Look at the then of verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man. Now we get the return of Jesus. You can see why the dispensational perspective puts all these together, right? Birth pangs, that's four to eight. Then the then of verse nine becomes a tribulation period. Then the then of verse 30 becomes the return of Jesus. See how it works? It makes sense. 
Um, you can also see how the more preterist position, or the, that, these, that some of this took place in the past, the verse four to eight is the normal run of the mill world. The then of verse nine is the destruction of the temple. After all, that's the question. Jesus said that the temple's gonna be destroyed. And then the then of verse 30 is Jesus's future return. Make sense? You gotta decide. I will let you decide. Uh, and you got to do that by using Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Daniel. And then you got to go read Revelation because Revelation's picking up on some of these same things. What yes. Is the, what are the two different views of, of three? Yeah. Of 30? Or of like the then being, because I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, because it was Ro, what would be the second of the Son of Man yeah, after that, the coming mm -hmm. of the So notice the questions. The questions are that they ask, and these questions guide the dialogue. What will be the sign of your coming? Or when, when will this happen, and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Okay, um, Many scholars think that he's answering those questions by saying, okay, when will this happen? And he starts talking about the temple being destroyed. Is that, is that what he's talking about with 4 through 29? Um, is that what he's talking about in 9 to 29? When will these things happen? What's he talking about? The temple being destroyed. That was the context of the whole discussion. Okay, when will that happen? Well, let me tell you, um, you're going to be handed over and persecuted. It's going to get really bad. When you see the abomination desolation, run, 70 AD. But the second question was, what will be the sign of your coming? He goes, hey, and, but after that, don't worry, don't fret, don't think it's all over, because one day the Son of Man will appear. So just know I'm not abandoning you. Would be the, it's almost like a, 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 a note of promise. Hey, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm with you. Don't worry. And so verse 30 and following would be Jesus saying, you asked about my coming again, and I hear I'm going to give it to you. Um, yeah, you got to work through it. We spent a lot of time on all of that because it's important. Uh, I thought we might. Um, look at page 83, just to turn to material here. Uh, regardless, if the abomination of desolation here is the Roman general Titus, then... Even if we take that category away, Paul seems to have a picture. You get it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here, I'll read it for you. The context of 2 Thessalonians 2 is he's planted a church in Thessalonica. Paul can't go back there. If he does, they'll kill him. Uh, go read Acts 17. He cannot go back. He can't set foot there again. And pr almost certainly one of their Christian churchgoers has died in the short interval that he went down to Athens. And... They're asking, I thought you said that resurrection had happened. I thought this was it. And Paul has to address that. What about those who have died? Just go read first and second Thessalonians, you'll see them. And in that context, there seems to be a lot of Christians who thought that Jesus was going to come back before any Christian would die. And Paul has to smooth that out. And in so doing, he says, now concerning the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him again, don't be unsettled or alarmed. The teaching allegedly from us that says that the day of the Lord has already come. No, don't be deceived, for the day will not come, big circle or underline, until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul seems to have some kind of a category that before Jesus returns, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be this great rebellion. I'm just going to let the language say what it says. This, that, that's, that, we'll just end it there. Before the end, Roland summarized, a figure will rise who will oppose God and personify evil and rebellion. It seems to be a Pauline category. We're not in Revelation. We're not even with Jesus here. Paul seems to anticipate something like that. Okay? We often refer to that as the Antichrist figure. Um, the son of perdition or the man of lawlessness, whatever you want to call him. I think that the category still holds. Even if you dance around it in Matthew 24 or Revelation 13, and the beast is not the Antichrist, but Rome itself. It's not in Revelation. I told you I didn't even want to talk about Revelation. But even if you dance around those, Paul seems to have the category for some kind of a great rebellion that will take place before Jesus returns. We could probably assert that. Feel good about that one? Um, then Jesus will return. That's why Roland's heading is the return of Christ. Now, um, Notice what he's got printed here. So this book, the, our faith book, will be taking the then of verse 9 and following as a future, future tribulation by the nature of how this was printed. Um, so, but the big idea we want to get is 
it's going to be obvious. So there was a dude in the 90s named, uh, his name, Apple White was his last name, was his first name. John, I think it was John Applewhite, something like that. It was called the Hale Bop Comet Cult. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they all took uh, cyanide. It was in California. They the, there's a comet that comes by like very rarely. I can't remember if it's every seventy years or maybe more than that. And every time this comet comes by, you can see it. It was coming by in the late nineties, and this group uh, thought that Jesus was on the back side of this comet. And they, were, they had a leader, they had a cult leader, and they really thought that this was going to be it, that Jesus was coming on the back of this comet. They had a Bible for it, the stars that fall from the sky, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so they thought, we need, to, we need to kill ourselves because then we'll be resurrected when Jesus comes. This is it. And they all put on, they put on like a New Balance shoe, like white. I remember, I'll never forget the news covers. They all put on the same shoe, like white shoes. They put black outfits on and white shoes. They laid under white sheets, like 90 of them in California, and they all took cyanide and killed themselves. And then the comet came and they left. Um, big idea. It will be obvious when Jesus returns. You, it'll be clear. Um, and you can read the passages there. Now, you have to decide on your thens. Because some would take all that's printed here as events surrounding Rome's destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Does that make sense? And it's only after the then in verse 30 that we see the sign of the Son of Man. So just make a note on that. Um, yeah, we'll move forward. Uh, then you get to Revelation 19. Now we've got to Revelation. This is not a class on Revelation. This is a class on eschatology, end times theology. Um, in Revelation 19, we see a vision of a rider on a white horse who it's clear the rider is supposed to be Jesus. Uh, he's got uh, symbolic tattoos. He's got a sword that is in his mouth, not his hands, which is a statement of the way that he judges. Um, I think we all Christians need to be careful. The picture of Jesus returning with an AK to wipe out the non-believers with a sword and a gun and a tank. If that's the case, then the sword should be in his hand. That's where the sword always was. Romans, go look at uh, Augustus. The sword is in his hand. Um, the sword is coming out of his mouth. And so we have to just massage out what does judgment look like. And in the Left Behind books, if I'm not mistaken, at one point Christians really do take up arms and kill the lost people. Which makes for a good novel. You know, I like war movies. Um, I don't think that's the way Jesus, I don't even love the way, to put a question mark by the word warrior in his big idea here. Um... There's a lot of commentators that notice that Jesus has a robe dipped in blood, but he hasn't gone into battle yet. So is that the blood of the enemies that he's smashing, or is it his own blood that he has soaked up on the cross? Revelation keeps making these counterclaims about power, so I tend to think that that's the subtle note that he's soaked in his own blood, which that sounds more like Jesus to me. Um, I'm not trying to diminish that he will bring judgment, and we have to wrestle with that. But the nature of the judgment is what I'm trying to get across. Uh, I think sometimes Christians get a little too antsy in their hatred for anybody wearing a hijab in that one. Um, and I'm, I don't know who's watching this. That's, I'm, I'm not meaning to make fun of anybody, but I think we need to tamp that down. Uh, you can see the vision. You've seen it before. Rider on the white horse. Um, that brings us to the key question that they ask in Acts chapter 1, which is, this the kingdom? That's an appropriate question for the disciples. Here's our expectations after all, remember? These four things. And you're going to have to wrestle with I keep saying it. You have to wrestle with it. You have to wrestle with Jesus' answer to this question. Hey, Jesus, you've been resurrected after all. Is this the kingdom? Is, are you now going to restore the kingdom? And here's the, man, here's the key interpretive question. I want you to write this next to this in Acts 1. Just, just note this. Does Acts 2 fulfill this? The receiving of power. Okay. What is the anticipated answer for the kingdom question? He, he, Jesus responds with delay, does he not? Um, it's not for you to know, but hey, you're going to receive power. Does he mean um, the kingdom's not happening now? It's going to come back when I return, but don't worry, you'll have power in the interim. Or does what he, what he, does what he have in mind, is it fulfilled in the next chapter after all? They don't 
Hold tight. You're asking about the kingdom? Hold tight. You're going to about to receive power. Kingdom, a kingdom word. You're about to receive power. In the next chapter, we see them receive the Holy Spirit. Major question with Acts. It sounds really simple, especially at when we teach it here at Fellowship. I think we go, so look, he said it's not for you to know. Therefore, the kingdom must be a future thing. I think the book of Acts may be more subtle than that in saying, you're going to receive power. Look at the next chapter. This is the kingdom coming. Like I said, y'all have to wrestle through and decide how much of this is fulfilled in Jesus' first coming in the early church. If you say a lot, then you're going to start answering questions like, the restored kingdom is chapter 2 of Acts. Pentecost is it. You're going, to start, you're going to be more on this covenant side. If you say, we get a down payment of this, but all this is future. We haven't seen it fulfilled yet. And you're going to dip more towards a, I need to see a future kingdom of Israel kind of thing. Are you seeing why this debate colors a lot of how you even read all your Bible? Um, that's, I've had a lot of people ask me, who cares? Why does this matter? And I go, well, you know, probably not a lot in your day-to-day -day Jesus following, but it really matters how you interpret. And that's what we're trying to do here is interpret the Bible. You're making a face. Oh my God, sorry. I just like was thinking through the four things. And the only one that like, I don't remember where it is in the Old Testament is recreated the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. like, where did they get that expectation? If you flip back to page 80 on the handout, it's like okay. the Isaiah. Um, see, I will create new heavens and new earth. Um, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they be, nor will they be brought to mind. Um, just read the last couple chapters of every prophetic book. You're going to see language like this. In that day, I will restore Israel, and the the uh, the wine will flow like honey. And you're going to see uh, and these pictures of the lamb laying down with the lion, and all this stuff. It's symbolic language to say a restored or recreated. I like restored. Probably I like that word better, but Isaiah is the word new, so we tend to go with recreated. Um, yeah, all that language that you're going to see all over those prophetic books. This was something I think that came up and grew up, and I thought it was kind of a weird way to spend time, but I guess maybe it is right. him talking about the difference between restored versus renewed, of mm -hmm. like the debate between is God going to obliterate yeah, yeah. make a whole new one, mm -hmm. or is he going to renew what is already mm -hmm. created? And I don't, I feel like you were kind of hinting at that with what you just said, of like you yeah. to use. I, I, I can understand the argument for a destroyed and re all the way redone. Um, to me, I think the, the even by the way I'm unpacking the narrative of the Bible, I like restored better. Um, and that would, I mean, that's going to matter on the, definitely, the scale yeah. of like if it's entirely destroyed and, and made over again, then it would have to be. Definitely. We've not experienced that. Exactly. Yeah. Cannot be experiencing that now. Um, huh. I, it, it, it all matters. It all matters. Yeah. All these so words. Like, yeah. Matter. yeah. All these words really matter. Um, and so when you use language in a systematic theology way, you are sometimes inadvertently creating a category like heaven's my favorite example. When we talk about heaven, we've created a big category for that in American culture and all uh, Western culture that largely is platonic and not biblical. But we've created a category when we use the word, we almost have to deconstruct it before we talk about it. And that's what a lot of teaching is. Uh, I know you got to go and Sorry. hang out with that kid all day. Uh, good luck with that. Um, so we have what? We have six minutes. Um, we see the note of resurrection. We've already seen it in Daniel. The New Testament is going to pick up on that idea, but with a newfound confidence because the resurrection's happened in the middle of history. Turn the page to page 86. Um, notice as well, this future day when judgment will be secured. Um, the Bama seat of Christ, 1 Corinthians 3. The judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. There seems to be a day when our, um, our lives will be examined, judged. Uh, I don't like to think of it as a scary thing. Uh, the purging of all of my bad and my bad motives will be burned away. Like you refine something in a fire. That's a cool image to me, even though I think oftentimes our image of this is we're all in a big stadium. We get brought down one by one and our like our worst sins, even as Jesus followers are shown on the jumbotron. But then Jesus still has to let us in. But we feel super ashamed. I don't think that's the idea. Uh, yes. You say so you just said, like, you know, we'll be all those 
purging of our sins uh, through fire. Is that like that idea coming out of Revelation, but also um, like be baptized through water, but you will also be baptized through fire? So that the baptized through fire idea is in Titus 3, and I think what Titus has in mind is the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit, flaming tongues of fire coming and being with us. Uh, I think he has in mind something more like that than the judgment seat, for example, um, or in this case is the example. So really the examples that we get on that are these that are printed here. Um, Roland has an illustration where uh, the rewards, like I don't love talking about rewards because it, just, I don't know why, it makes me feel weird. Uh, Roland has an example that he used and I think that's a cool way to talk about it. Imagine that that mom who for years hosted cell groups, discipled in her house, hosted community groups, saw lots of life change, made the brownies, did the whole thing, but never got any attention for it. She just faithfully served her community group, cell group kids, discipled her kids. And this is Roland's anecdotal little illustration, but always stuck with me. He goes, the reward, imagine in the restored earth, Jesus is walking down the restored Springdale, let's say. And he goes, and see this house right here? He's got that mom right here. There's a crowd. He goes, nobody saw what happened here. But how many of you, they go, man, my life was changed there. That'd be the reward. I go, that's pretty cool. That, that gets me going a little bit. Like, I like that. Like, y'all, nobody got, she got no glory here. But let me tell you what happened in this house. I hear that and I go, that's pretty cool. Uh, gold bars, I don't think we're going to need them anyway. So that doesn't get me going as much as I'm working for that. Um, that, that that'd be a cool idea. Uh, that brings us to the rapture. I did it on purpose. I left you with three minutes. Uh, did it on purpose. Yeah, did it on purpose. Um, Paul in First Thess. Remember the context of the Thessalonian letters is somebody has died. And he wants them to not grieve as those who have no hope. And he gives us this, idea, this picture of resurrection. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have died. Okay. Now, Look at verse 16. The dead in Christ will rise first, and after that we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. There's the word uh, harpazo is the Greek word. It becomes the uh, Latin word rapturo, which is where we get rapture. There's rapture. Caught up, snatched up. Harpazo, harpoon. That's where we get harpoon. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will be with the Lord forever. And this is supposed to be an encouragement. Here's your big idea. We will be resurrected and reunited. Um, notice that this passage says nothing about timing. This that does not orient you to time. The passage is entirely about the confidence you and I should have in the resurrection because we see it in Jesus. If he, ro if he rose, we can have the confidence that we will have the same kind of resurrection. This is landing squarely on the Pharisee's side of a bodily resurrection. Um, it says nothing about the timing of that. Uh, many Christians put that timing before what's printed on the next page. So scroll down. Revelation articulates a day, a thousand year reign of peace, where God will reign and the resur and resurrected beheaded saints will reign with him. And many Christians see that, in fact the church you go to sees that as a picture of a future thousand year kingdom on earth. And they would say, here's, here's why. You, you got to go to the logic here. It's just a couple of verses. They would say, see, now we get all these things fulfilled. Revelation's talking about the future. And finally, after all the pain of Revelation, all these good things are going to start happening. And they would put all these as merely a foretaste now. Why, do, why is Revelation trying to clarify for us then? One day you're going to get it. That's, these expectations will come true. Revelation anticipates that, and it gives us a great shining picture of it in chapter 20, which comes after chapter 19. Jesus returns in 19, now we have a thousand year reign. You have to explain that. Um, and that becomes uh, the mantra for this camp. Your dispensational camp is taking a massive amount of their understanding. Not just It's not like they just took one verse of Revelation and said, let's run with it. They've got these expectations. They've got these kinds of passages. And this is how they're going to form that together. It's really well thought out. It's very well reasoned. Um, and you're going to have to interact with that. Revelation 19 just returns. Revelation 20, we've got a thousand year reign. Okay, 20 to 19, that fits our expectations. Perhaps really after Jesus returns, which he hasn't returned, maybe it is after Jesus returns that all these cool things start to happen. In which case, this first coming was a foretaste 
or down payment or whatever we want to use. You're down, hardcore going to use words like no, it's nothing. But you're more progressive and revised dispensationalists are going to use words like uh, it's a foreshadowing or it's the already but not yet, that kind of language. We live in the already of it, but there's going to be a not yet where this happens. And however you unpack that language, you need to unpack it. And we've talked, all of us have talked about this. Um, but this is where it really, it really matters. All these passages, now they come full circle. Um, big leftover questions. We didn't even talk personal eschatology. Heaven, afterlife. I'm so glad we didn't even talk about Revelation. What's your... Your chart that you use for Revelation, where it's like the four views that you Yeah, here's your chart. Um, I guess we should probably talk about Revelation some. Uh, you know what I really have we didn't do? We didn't chart out pre mill, post mill, all mill, oh, you know, all that. That's what I didn't want to that's do. The only reason we came that's why, that's what you wanted. Um, yeah, I wanted to answer. I can do that for you if you'd like. I mean, uh, I didn't know it. I don't. Past, present, and future. This is from Gorman's book. And this would be on this side one. To one, meaning one to one correspondence, meaning this is a set of code, but it means one literal thing. This would be a, this would be seeing the language as symbolic, or a lens to see all things that look and sound that way. And so, am I looking for a one to one, or am I looking for this is a lens of maybe a lens of critique even? This is called the preterist, meaning. This is all past events, but it's one-to-one. -one. That beast is that Caesar. Not many Caesars or all who come in the name of power. That one beast, for example, is that Caesar. That city is Rome, blah, 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 blah. This one is called the Futurist. This is the church you go to. They put their mark squarely here. Futurist would be, it has a one-to-one -one meaning. That beast is a future Antichrist figure, or that city is a future city where that uh, whore on the beast is a future. But that, that, they're putting their mark here. Future, one-to-one. -one. This side, really it's a big X on this side, doesn't see this as a one-to-one -one correspondence at all. This is called the idealist position. Because they don't see it as a one-to-one -one correspondence at all, they then would say that it can represent all those, all beasts who come like that, kings and kingdoms, both Rome and present and a future one. Um, we're to, it's looking at the book of Revelation as a lens to by which to see things in the in their day, if that makes sense. It's the idealist in the middle, like line. It's really past. Like you could have seen this true okay, then just, and now and future. Yes, I'm putting a big X okay. because they they look at it as a as a critique of power, largely. The view that uh, I would like to put out to you. I think I had too many C's in that. I think it's just one C. Is the eclectic view. Um, the eclectic view is the view that it definitely has some past elements that ring true. It definitely has some idealist perspective. It's a critique. And it definitely has some potential future ramifications. That sounds more like the idealist view, um, but it's maybe a mediating position called the eclectic view. Um, so that you can see the chart. Or you can see a, a chart. I always find these to add confusion. This is why I don't like teaching it this way, but let's redo it real fast. None of you seem like you're dying to get out of here right now. Um, let me chart this for you so you can see this. Questions on that chart over there, by the way? Is historic in there, too? Yeah, historic view, historist view is basically like that, except it's literal. Histor and I don't like, I don't like the one, the word literal, because Symbolic language is literal. Um, I have a literal meaning with it. I mean you to see this symbolically. So I don't like the word literal or figurative. The historicist view would see things as a one-to-one. -one, but when we look back over the course of all of church history, we'll realize that that beast was Genghis Khan. And that beast was Hitler. And that horse was this empire. But it's over the, we'll look back, it'll be over the course of all of church history. So the preterist is mostly mostly describes events in the first century. Future it mostly describes events at the end times, the future end times, and the historicist view is it describes events across all of church history, but in a one-to-one -one way. The idealist view is that it describes all empires, 
and how God's people should live under those empires. Uh, here's your charts. And I guess you need to know this. Uh, y'all can, anybody can leave any time. We're over time at this point. Um, here's your charts. So taking all of this stuff, let's draw out how people understand um, the end times, okay? Uh, we have all these Old Testament expectations that we've drawn over there, okay? That's, we want to start there. All these Old Testament expectations. Some would say that all those Old Testament expectations have been fulfilled in this thing called Jesus and the church. We have a kingdom now. We have new creation ground now. We're seeing the blessings go out. Jesus has been resurrected. Those who would say that those expectations are being fulfilled in the church, we're living in God's kingdom now, tend to be called. So the kingdom is now. God's heavenly kingdom is right now. Everybody acknowledges that one day Jesus will come back and that we're going to get new heavens and new earth. Nobody debates that. But those that say we're in the heavenly kingdom now, they tend to be called the all-millennial perspective, all-millennialism. All-atheist means no God. Um, All-millennialism means they don't think there's a millennial earthly kingdom. That comes from Revelation 20, this idea of the thousand-year reign. This group, I think it's a bad name for them. They think that we're in the kingdom. They just don't think it's an earthly kingdom. See the difference? So all millennial is a bit of a misnomer. Um, They think we're in God's kingdom. The Old Testament expectations of God's kingdom have been established here in Jesus. Uh, Yes. So they would, so all millennial right now, would they see us like, they, I guess they combine church age, millennium, tribulation, we're in all of it now. Different, different persuasions. Some would say, okay, sure, maybe we'll get really bad before Jesus comes back. Mm-hmm. That would be a matter of interpreting like a Olivet Discourse, for example. Yeah. But largely they're going to say, we are experiencing the millennial kingdom now. The great thousand-year reign is now, and it's a figurative kind of reign. It, it's... I don't like any of the language how it's usually articulated Wait, that's by millennialism. Is that a different? That'd be all, uh, it's articulated it's poorly there. by its opponents. No, or it's happening right now. We're in the kingdom now, but it's a spiritual kingdom. Yeah. Um, your Bible project guys are here. I mean, what's in Asian in again? New heavens and new earth. I should write things out. So new heavens and new earth. This would be the recreate. This is this is eternal eternal state. Um, arrow. What are your arrows? Jesus is that's Jesus's second coming. Okay. Yeah, let me so. They would also, uh, that second coming, they would see the rapture, if it were to happen, would be at So the what coming. the rapture being the first Thessalonians passes, those yep. who have dead, died in Christ, yep. they would see the rapture. Some would take the rapture, almost most amillennialists take the rapture as coming right here. So we're resurrected with Jesus, and then we come to rule and reign with him at a second coming. Make sense? So Simon, t- Simon t- pretty much like puts it all like it'll happen to once. Like, essentially, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, essentially. So it's one event. Mm-hmm. Um, this is uh, Keller. Uh, Piper's adjusted his view. Bible Project guys present this view. Now what they're presenting is the Old Testament expectations have been fulfilled. Okay, they're not saying, oh, it's all figurative. It doesn't really matter. They're saying it's been fulfilled in Jesus. So I want to be. I want to articulate what they're saying appropriately and not caricature them. That's what often happens. Yes. This is just doesn't add anything or help anything. But like, would NT right? What's that view? They just trumpet what NT right says. So yes, yes. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. The Old Testament expectations have been fulfilled in Jesus. Okay. This is the all mill view. The second one we'll draw. I'll do the pre mill one now. Um, We've got the same Old Testament expectations. Jesus, nobody argues, no Christians argue that Jesus really died and really rose from the dead. So we're agreed on that. And all Christians think that Jesus comes back. Okay, there's our second coming. And all Christians think that there's going to be an eternal state, a new heavens and a new earth. I mean, almost all Christians. I shouldn't say all ever. But here's what the pre-millennial people will say. They will say, and I made this point a minute ago, Jesus' second coming so I want to make, I'll, I'll let everybody's drawn and, and can follow me here. 
Jesus' second coming is in Revelation 19. And it's followed by a thousand year reign of peace. So 19 comes before 20. This is Jesus' second coming. This must be the kingdom. And this essentially becomes your pre, so here's the language. Millennial kingdom is what this castle represents. This is the millennium. Jesus' return is pre-millennial kingdom. That's the language. So when you hear all millennialism is, they don't see this kingdom on earth at all. So I'm not drawing a castle here. They think it's a heavenly kingdom. So I'm using that language here. On this one, I have drawn the kingdom. This is an earthly kingdom where God's people rule and reign with Jesus as king. Revelation 19, Revelation 20. A thousand years, the dead in Christ came to reign for a thousand years. This is the hallmark right here. That's the key thing you're doing with pre-millennialism. You go to a pre-millennial church. Okay? Revelation 19 comes for 20. This is going to happen in the future. Now, we got to nuance this out a little bit. Okay? Some pre-millennialists, this camp, will take the rapture as taking place just like the amillennial. They'll say the rapture takes place right before and almost it's the same event, Jesus' is second coming. This group is called the post-tribulation rapture group because they think that this period that we're in now is what Matthew's talking about with the great tribulation. We're in it, in a sense, now. Um, or there'll be a future seven-year period, and the rapture will occur after that. Depends on how they want to articulate Daniel in some other passages. Yes. Why did fellowship be pre-trib though? Yes. Kind of yeah, we're, we haven't drawn that one yet. Yeah. Um, so this is post pre-mill post-trib. This would be Piper. That's where he lands now. How make sense of the going up and coming down? Like we're raptured up, but then we come right back down to then. Dwell so on Earth what they would say days. is here's their here's how they would answer that. When a king would enter a, it's like when a Caesar would enter an, an ancient city like Ephesus, the people would go out of the city to meet their king and form a 